Greetings to the brethren. Greetings to my fellow followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's great to be back. Man, this one's going to go deep. <laughs> so uh, I've been going through a very interesting uh, season of my life recently. The last couple months, something very interesting has happened, which is that I went through some different struggles and this and that and was reflecting on things, but I started to see something deeper. Uh, our Father, God, has, he began to show me certain things or draw my attention towards certain things about our world, certain things people said to me, and it led me down this path where I started to see more and more and more about Satan, particularly the way that Satan deceives us. And what he's shown me, man, it's just led this it's been like a roller coaster of every day seeing a bigger piece and seeing more of it. And then he points out more to me. And then I go to sleep and have a dream. It makes me realize even more. And then I write it down. And man, I got to say, it has been utterly fascinating and also a bit exhausting, to be honest. I mean, way back uh, earlier at the beginning of the year, I received a message from someone who said, Evan, you know, the Lord wanted me to say this to you. And it contained some, some fascinating things. And one of the things it said was... Uh, God said something like, uh, you know, he's, he's shown you many things already, but he has a lot more that he's going to show you. And man, has that turned out to be true. So without any more ado, let me jump into the subject of this, uh, which is all about Satan, all about our society, and all about how Satan works. Now, why is it important to understand Satan? Why would we even want to know about Satan? Well, I'll tell you why. Because... Satan, who is our adversary, who is the adversary of all that is holy and good and true, what is his nature? Is he the powerful one? Is he the evil one? Yeah, he is. But the Bible describes him as the deceiver. He is the father of lies. And the thing about deception is that deception works if you're not aware of it. As soon as you realize that deception is deception, it loses its power. It only works if it tricks you. Now, we all know, uh, we know a lot of things already about how Satan works. He tries to get us to sin. He tries to hide the reality of God. And the typical way that we think of it is, you know, you picture the cartoon devil appearing on your shoulder and the, and the little angel and the angel says like, do what's right. Don't take the woman's purse that fell on the ground. But then the, the evil one's like, come on, just do it. You know, you want that money. No one will even see. And that's kind of what I call the Captain Obvious version of Satan. Like Satan's like, come on, just commit evil. Just be bad. Just do sin. Now, I don't deny that Satan does that. And I don't deny that that's dangerous. But in my opinion, that is just the tip of the iceberg of how Satan operates. Because that level of deception, it's pretty easy to see what it is. Now, no doubt Satan gets us. He's got me with that level. He gets all of us at times. But Satan is a supernatural being. And if we look at what the scripture says, he was created with the seal of perfection. He was the highest of all of God's creation. So Satan is really like an evil super genius. When he deceives you, he's not just going to make it obvious. Now, sometimes it is, you know, uh, but the real effective deception that he has, we don't even see it. We're not even aware of it. And that's exactly why it works. Because if we could just see it everywhere, it wouldn't pose a whole lot of a threat. But the fascinating thing uh, is, are the ways that he deceives us that we are not aware of. And for this video, I'm particularly interested in how he deceives us on a societal level. What I mean by that is, yes, he deceives us individually. He targets us. He knows about us. He tricks us individually. But he is the prince of the earth. He controls the media. He controls the culture and sets the cultural norms. And so what I'm particularly interested in is how does he deceive the whole culture? So not just how does he deceive you personally, but how does he get the whole culture to believe things that are incorrect? Because that's what's really powerful. Because if you can deceive everyone at a cultural level, then regardless of what their personal beliefs are or whatever, if there's something that they all believe in the culture, that affects everyone. And since we are living at the end times, on the cusp of the rapture, what we know is that Satan's domination of the world culture is at an absolute zenith right now. I mean... You can just feel it right now. There's just this spiritual darkness that's just settling onto everything. And the question is, how does he do that exactly? What is this palpable spiritual darkness? And I would say that 
the essence of Satan is that, first of all, you have to understand, we have free will. Satan cannot force us to do anything. The scripture says that if you resist the devil, he flees from you. But to do that, you would have to know when you're interacting with the devil, right? You would have to know, this is the deception, this is Satan. Then you can resist it. Of course, you might not, but imagine if you didn't even know you were interacting with the devil, right? If you don't even realize, how are you going to resist it? And so the thing about Satan is we have free will. So at any point, we can choose to do what's right. So Satan, the way he operates, and this is why he's called the deceiver. He doesn't force us to do anything. He tricks us. He deceives us. That's why, although it's, it's true that you can be deceived by willingly committing sins, and we all do, I would put forth that really the way Satan operates is that he tries to get you to misperceive reality. And then when you act on it, boom, that's how he gets you. Because if we think about free will for a moment, you know, typically, if you think of free will, you think about our freedom to do whatever we want, to choose actions A, B, or C. But really, at the most fundamental level, free will also includes our freedom to perceive things however we want, right? That's the, the real most fundamental thing we can do is how we choose to look at things, what we choose to believe. Now, this is very important. In fact, all of our salvation, notice that God makes it conditional, not on anything that we do, but on what we choose to believe. If we choose to believe the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what uh, grants us salvation. So you can see here that God the Father is very aware of the importance of belief and of the fact that we're free to believe anything we want. And so I would put forth that Satan launches his attacks at us by tricking us into misperceiving reality and getting us to perceive things that aren't true. Uh, and if you factor that in, you don't have to have poor intentions to get trapped by Satan. You don't have to want to commit any sins. You can have all the best intentions. But if Satan can trick you as to the nature of reality, and then you act based on those beliefs, bam, he gets you in the net. Um, and so the question becomes, how does he do this? Uh, and man, what God has shown me about it, whoa, it has been intense. Because I'm telling you, it affects everything. And it's at the base of our culture. And it's you can see it within so many things. After God showed me some of these things, I'm just looking at our society, looking at what we believe. And I'm like, man, it's all around us. It's, it's so hidden. It's not what you would think it is, right? Because if it's all Captain Obvious Satan, like sin is good, you know? If you were to ask people, you know, how is Satan currently deceiving our culture, right? Because if he controls the culture, which he does, and if right now we're at the edge of the end times when his power is at its maximum, we should be able to look at our culture and see clear areas where Satan has warped things. Now, of course, we can. We see like ceremonies where people are pretty much worshiping Satan at the Grammys and, you know, all kinds of thing, articles coming out about why marriage oppresses you or blah, 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 or, you know, maybe, uh, drill music that says like, yeah, killing people is cool. Kill it up. Awesome. You know, or whatever it is. Now, all of that is real. That's, that's a real footprint of Satan. But what I've realized through looking at what God's showing me is, oh, there's a whole deeper level. You can see all that stuff and resist that stuff. And that's great. But where, in my opinion, Satan really does the damage is in the deception you don't see that you don't even think of. And Satan is a genius. He knows how to hide things. And I have to admit, there's been moments when I'm looking at this stuff where I was just marveling at it. Like, that works so well. Like, how would you even realize that? Well, I'm like impressed by it. But it makes sense. Why? Because who created Satan? God. So if God is going to create an entity with the seal of perfection and have a divine plan that anticipates that he will take over the world and so on, I mean, you better believe that entity is going to be good at his job. And so I bring you this stuff today in the hopes that in seeing how it works, you'll be able to avoid it and you'll be able to start to step out of some of these traps that he's got us all trapped in, both believers and non-believers. Uh, and it's a lot of information, man. I've written down a bunch of sermons being like, should I start with this? Should I start with this? It's a pretty deep subject. And I think to really comprehend it, you have to th think about it a bit. It's not something that's so easy to see, although in some ways it is, which is what's strange about it. Uh, but it makes sense because if a super genius deceiver entity deceived everyone with a super clever way, you wouldn't really expect that it would be that easy to see. You'd expect that it'd be like hard to see even when it's in plain sight. And that's the strange thing about this stuff. 
So I'm going to have to make a series of videos about this. But God just keeps bringing my attention back to it. And just when I think, okay, I think I'm understanding this piece of it, he gives me another piece of it. So from what I can tell is what God wants me to do is to just understand this stuff as best I can, get the pieces, and then try to explain it, try to break it down in a way that others can see. And I think the more that we can see it, the less it works. And I can even see in my own life how certain personal issues that I've had, certain things I struggle with, I start to look at this stuff and I'm like, wait a minute, is the real cause of the thing I'm suffering from this or could it be? And I'm like, whoa, now it starts to make sense why I'm stuck in some of these loops. Wow, now it makes sense of this. But what I'm seeing is, dude, it's our society. Our society is is like it was designed by an evil supervillain because so much of this stuff is like a poison masquerading as a cure. So much of the sicknesses that we're all trapped in in weird ways that no one quite understands and they keep getting worse even though we're all talking about them and we don't like them, it's like, yeah, because the poison's hidden in the cure. And to understand it, you have to be willing to step back and examine some of the beliefs that we all have about stuff that are so deep down, we don't even realize we believe them because Satan is an expert at knowing where to hide these lies. He puts them in places that no one will ever even look for them, in places that are that you don't even know exist because certain assumptions are so deep, you don't even stop to think that you assume it. You don't even know you assume it because it's, it's so unconscious. It's like when someone tells it to you, you almost have to stop and be like, wait, what are they even saying? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, of course, because it just seems so basic. But man, Satan has embedded these deceptive beliefs in our whole society. And anyway, before I go on and on about it some more, I might as well jump into some examples of it. This is just scratching the, the surface, and I have a lot more, and I have more ways it connects to the scripture. But I want to see if in this video I can get kind of the basic idea across. Do like a little introduction. Because these videos that I'm going to do about it, it almost might seem like a university course on the nature of deception. Um, and so this is going to be like the intro. Uh, and I, I hope it's useful. I hope that it helps people see. I think it applies to non-believers and believers. And if it succeeds, you're going to start questioning some of the most basic things that we think we know about depression and addiction and relationships and all kinds of stuff, ADD, like all these things uh, in our society that we think we understand, but they just get worse and worse. And why are they so bad now? And how come if we have the answer to it, then it just gets worse even when everyone knows the answer? And uh, my answer to it is because of Satan, because there's a lot we're not seeing and he just has us bound up in, you know, people call it the matrix or whatever. It's like, what's the matrix made of? What are the prison bars of it made of? They're made of false beliefs, of lies, and they're so subtle that we don't notice them. And what they do is they trick us into misusing our free will in ways that keep us bound within this pattern. And what's fascinating is if you really dig down into them and look at them, what you notice is they're inversions of biblical statements. <laughs> this is where it gets crazy. If you analyze a lot of these things, what you realize is, although they don't appear on the surface because they're very well disguised, what this actually is, is exactly what the Bible says, but reversed. Because think about it. We know this is true. And if this contains wisdom and great truth, and if applying this can bring about all kinds of good results, well, what would happen if you did the opposite of this? What would it bring about? Well, it would pretty much be the quickest way to ruin things. Well, <laughs> right there... We start to see a bit what's happening here because Satan doesn't just say things that aren't true. He do, it's not just like, well, the truth's here, but you believe something here. It's not the truth. No. The essence of the lie of Satan is that it is an inversion of the truth. It's flipping the truth around. So weirdly enough, that actually gives it a relationship with the truth that's very close. It's just reversed. So it gets you to do exactly the wrong thing. And... Without me going into it anymore, I'm going to try to make these videos somewhat digestible or, or try to. I don't know if it'll work, <laughs> but I'm going to go into some examples of what I'm talking about here. And I hope that if I give enough examples and I blabber on about it enough, you might start to see this big picture and it might hit you like it's hit me. Like, wow, we have a supernatural deceptive entity at work and it's controlling our society and it's completely malevolent. <laughs> so anyway, let's begin. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Seeing this stuff has been incredible, man. It's, it's been quite the journey. Okay. So the first thing I've, I've noticed about Satan's deception that's interesting 
is that he likes to put these deceptive beliefs, really these negations of the Bible, not where you think he would, right? Because anything that people believe, people are going to debate. People are going to look at it in different sides. If I believe, if my main beliefs are A, B, and C, some other group might believe D, E, and F, some other group, da, da, da. So if you put the deception in people's like main beliefs, not really the best place because people are always debating those. And if anything you assert, someone else is going to say the opposite. And so interesting thing about Satan is where I really see a lot of these deceptive beliefs are not even in the things that one group believe or another thing. It's more like what I'd like to call the background beliefs, statements which seem innocuous, which seem harmless, which just like something, hey, we all could agree on statements that you could go up to Christians and say, and they'd probably be like, yeah, you know, or at least in some cases, you know, things that just seem like not even a big deal, just kind of like some basic piece of information we don't even think of because, yeah, just everyone knows that's what it is. That's where Satan loves to hide the real deceptive beliefs. Why? Because nobody ever stops and examines those. What we examine is the thing over here. You know, it's like if I say something to you, I'm like, look, we all know that, you know, A and B. But the question is, is C true? I mean, is C this or is it this? And it just kind of makes you look at C and wait a minute. Do we really all know A and B? And if you can make A and B just seem obvious enough and da da da, then Al, you're debating over C and A and B just slide right in there. And that's how these things work. And if you really want to see a lot of the satanic deceptive beliefs, look at what I call the background beliefs of our society. Things that don't even seem to be particular to a certain society. Things that just like, well, everyone kind of agrees this because it's just obvious, right? Then ask yourself, wait a minute, is it really obvious? And then ask yourself, wait a minute, what does this imply? And who? So, Man, I thought of so many examples of this. I don't know where to begin. Let's start with the basic one. Oh, to give you an idea of what I'm saying about these kind of background beliefs, you know, how many people might agree, for example, uh, with the statement that, uh, you know, other people are never really going to love you unless you can love yourself first. You know, it seems pretty reasonable, right? I mean, a lot of people would agree with that, you know, in different spiritual paths. You know, the thing is, we all want other people to love us. But, you know, what I found in my journey was that I, I didn't love myself. And I realized that, you know, what I wanted so much was for other people to love me and treat me with respect. But one day it came when I thought, you know, they're never going to do that unless I really start loving myself and start treating myself well first. You know, hey, doesn't that sound like a reasonable thing? Doesn't that sound kind of wise? Maybe you can relate to that. I mean, doesn't that sound like if you went to some support group, people might kind of say that. I mean, who's going to say, no, you shouldn't love yourself. I mean, no, nobody's going to balk at that and be like, that's absurd. Love yourself. You know, kind of a little background belief. And notice the package it appears in. It's supposed to help you. It's like a profound thing. It's like, hey, here's a little piece of profound wisdom I found that I'm sharing with you. You know, you want other people to love you. First, you got to say, do you really love yourself? You know, <laughs> and but the interesting thing about it is if you now some people might already be like, yeah, our society's all about loving yourself and yourself, yourself. And yeah, that you can kind of see what's wrong with it. But what's interesting about it is. If you look at the Bible, for example, you know, a very well-known thing from the Bible, a quote that almost everyone knows, is Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, the classic golden rule, right? Like, uh, if you want other people to do something to you, do it to them. Oh, this is interesting, because this statement says... You have to do it to yourself, right? Now, this is interesting. Now, see that? See how it's actually saying that exact same thing. It's saying whatever it were that you would want other people to do to you, you must first do to yourself. But wait a minute. That's totally not what the Bible says. The Bible says you should do it to others. So if the way to get other people to love you, you know, if our society says you got to love yourself first, in fact, you can't, other people won't love you. It's impossible. They'll never love you unless you first love yourself. But wouldn't the Bible say something more like, if you want other people to love you, treat you with love, you should treat them with love. So why is this belief so toxic? Has anyone ever stopped and really thought about, can you love yourself? Doesn't everyone naturally love themselves? Is that really something that you can do? I mean, if you love yourself more, are there like two selves, like the one who's loving the other one more? Like the whole thing doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, how do you love yourself exactly? Say, I've been love God. Okay, there's God. I can love him. Love this other person. It all makes sense. But as soon as you say love yourself, how do you really do that? I mean, don't you, don't you love yourself? Like, doesn't everyone love themselves? 
I mean, if you think about it, someone's in some state and they're suffering, right? And you're like, man, the thing is, the state you're in, you know, and the person's crying out, they're in pain because they're addicted to heroin or something. And you say like, hey, you know, you really need to start loving yourself more. But the thing is, if they didn't love themselves, then shouldn't they be happy they're suffering, <laughs> right? Like the very fact that they're crying out, doesn't that show they love themselves? And that's why they're discontent that this isn't going wrong. Like if it's true that you really don't love yourself, then shouldn't it be like awesome if you're addicted to heroin? Like, shouldn't you like suffering? It's kind of like saying, like, the problem is you enjoy suffering. But suffering by definition is something you don't enjoy. So anyway, the reason I pointed out is it's this belief is not just wrong, but it's like I call them the poison pill beliefs. Because if I convince you that if you really want other people to love you, the first thing you have to do is love yourself. But what if you, what if that's impossible? What if that doesn't even make sense? Then you're going to keep trying to love yourself, trying to love yourself. And notice how I could actually use it to stop you from loving other people. So if you're like, you know, you're, you're trying to interact with other people. You're like, I just want their acceptance. And you're trying to like go out and like love them or whatever. But I say, hey man, wait, slow, hold your horses. If you want other people to love you, the first thing you got to do is love yourself. Meaning don't do that. Do this other thing first. But what if that other thing is inherently impossible and doesn't make sense? Then it's like, just as you're going to do the thing that would actually work, which is love other people, love them, serve them, do things for them. It's like, no, no, we want that. But first do this thing, which is impossible. <laughs> you know, then it's like, hmm, interesting. And uh, see how that would actually be a really good belief if you were trying to stop people from being able to love others and have people love them. What better way than send them off on a weird wild goose chase that's impossible? But isn't it strange how everyone kind of just goes along with that statement, like everyone sort of agrees. It's like such a platitude, such an ordinary thing. It doesn't even really seem controversial. But the strange thing about it is, isn't it actually totally absurd? Like, for example, if the whole idea is that other people love you based on how much you love yourself, and that if the first thing to do to get them to love you is to love yourself, you know, then, you know, actually think about it for a second. <laughs> think about it. Imagine... You go out and you're just like, man, I just love myself. You talk to someone, they're like, how are you doing today? You're like, man, today I was just thinking about, about, you know, about the job I do. And I'm just thinking, man, I do such a good job. I can't believe it. It's so great. You know, I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was just thinking, what a beautiful person. Like, just imagine you say that. How are people actually going to react to that? Are they going to be like, I love you so much, right? What if, what if the opposite is true? What if you don't love yourself? What if you go up to people and you say like, man, today I'm just feeling like, you know, I, I, I try my best, but sometimes I feel like I'm just not contributing much to the world. How do people react then? Isn't it more likely that they're going to be like, hey, man, don't be so hard on yourself. Like, you know, you probably do contribute to the world. But if you're like, man, today I was just thinking I give so much to the world. It's just beautiful. <laughs> the reality is people, are, people do not react to you based on how much you love yourself. People that go around in love with themselves we don't, that's just inherently kind of disturbing. And yet the opposite, which this saying says is like the truth, is totally not true. If you go around and you don't love yourself, people's reaction is they usually have sympathy for you. If, if you know, people usually try to cheer you up. So what's weird is, how is this saying, which is the conventional wisdom, it's totally the opposite of all of our experience, right? Wouldn't anyone agree with me that like, if you go around in love with yourself, that doesn't make other people love you. That kind of drives other people away because you seem like a prick, <laughs> you know. But if you're kind of down and you're like, oh, I just don't know about this, people tend to be more sympathetic towards you. So how is it that the conventional wisdom of our society, one, is something that's pretty much everybody would agree actually isn't true, <laughs> that just seems to defy all of our experience. And yet we all believe it. We all kind of think it's profound, or at least most people do. And yet it also has us do something that totally stops us from achieving the supposed goal of the statement itself. Doesn't that seem a little weird? <laughs> almost seems like whoever is making these uh, statements in our society is almost trying to confuse our society. So anyway, um, that's, that's just one little example there of this kind of phenomenon uh, that I'm describing here. And what you're going to see is, oh man, this phenomenon is everywhere. And the level of conventional wisdom statements, oh, that's just like the surface of it. Wait till we look at some other parts of our society. So anyway, um, now the interesting thing about a lot of these forms of satanic deception is they kind of disguise what they're truly saying. That's, they, they kind of, you know, if I were to ask you, like, I just made a new song. Do you think it's beautiful? And you said something like, I'm sure 
that someone somewhere would be able to see the beauty in it, right? Like on the surface, it seems like I'm saying something positive to you, but obviously that's not the real <laughs> message. So if you said that, you'd be like, wow, all right? Now, the thing about these satanic statements is they, they're, they're made like this. On the surface, they almost seem to say one thing, but if you really look at them, they say something else. The way that the loving yourself statement kind of says like, it's great that you want others to love you, but stop, you know, directly interacting with them and first focus on loving yourself, right? That's what it's really saying. <laughs> um, so let's see, let's, let's look at, let's jump ahead to another example here. Oh man. Oh, this is, this is a good one here. Another, another belief that we all kind of say, we all hear it. We all sort of believe it. You know, I mean, would you agree with me that, Hey, there can't be light without darkness, right? I mean, Hey, that's something that you hear said a lot. And, uh, let's look at this a little bit. Well, first of all, it's a direct contradiction of the Bible, which say, which says in first John one verse five, this then is the message we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So that's the first thing you notice is, well, if this statement's true, it seems to say the God of the Bible can't exist. Because if you can't have light without darkness, well, then that's false. The Bible's wrong, right? It seems to say that the, the God of the Bible can't exist, right? It doesn't even say like he doesn't. It says like he can't. It's impossible because you can't have light without darkness, Um but let's look more at this belief. The interesting thing about this belief is it's not really a element of any particular belief system. It's not like a thing that Buddhists say. It's kind of just something that you hear that everybody says. And it's the sort of thing that a lot of people, Buddhists would probably agree with it. You know, uh, some Christians might agree with it. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, uh, people who are atheists would probably agree with it. You know, uh, it's just kind of this background belief that almost all the belief systems, if anything, Christians should disagree with it. But the other belief systems, it's just this little innocuous thing that they would all sort of agree on. And isn't it interesting how the book of Revelation describes that in the end times, Satan will unite all the world's religions and turn them against the truth. So how does that happen? Because the different religions, well, they disagree on things, you know. But what's interesting is look at the things they all agree on. And I would say that they're little statements like this, that, our, that everybody just kind of knows that. Hey, man, you can't have light without darkness. Notice how it just seems so true. It just feels true. Like, yeah, I mean, we all, it doesn't say why. It just says like, this is true. And it's like, yep. Oh, well, we all know that's true. You can't, you can't have light without darkness. Um, and I would say that what we're seeing here are, is the framework, the core that Satan is using to unite all of the different uh, belief systems that are opposed to this right here. And it's innocuous. It's subtle. It's just something we kind of grow up knowing. But let's look for a second at this belief a little bit more. All right. Whoa. Look at the implications of this belief. Because sometimes it's not even the statement on the surface that really conveys the dark power. It's the implications of it. So if it's true that you can't have light without darkness, then first of all, though well, the God of the Bible can't exist. The Bible's wrong because the Bible says in God, there's no uh, darkness at all. So but think about that. If you can't have light without darkness, that means darkness and another thing I should say here is notice that what this statement really is saying uh, is you can't have good without evil. See, that's a feature of these statements. They don't say what they're really saying. They just imply it. And so you kind of don't notice. But this statement obviously isn't talking about literal light and darkness. What it really is saying is, hey, you can't have good without evil. Hmm. OK, so let's look at that. If that's true, then it says that uh, evil is is inevitable. It's actually necessary. It's just part of the game. In fact, good couldn't even exist without it. So, hey, if you like good, well, then you're going to have to accept that there's evil, right? And so resisting evil, well, that would just be foolishness, right? Because you can't have good uh, without evil, right? So why resist it, you know? And why resist it, trying to lessen it? Dude, it's, it's almost like you'd be getting rid of good because you can't have good without evil. And furthermore, um, it seems to kind of say, that even trying to differentiate them is pointless because ultimately, if you can't have good without evil, then evil is contributing to the existence of good, right? And so evil is actually holding up good, right? Like you wouldn't even want to get rid of evil even if you could because good can't exist without it. So it's almost like it's a part of the good. 
What it almost seems to be saying is like, but the deeper thing at the deeper level, evil and good are kind of two sides of the same coin. So if you like the coin, well, then you got to accept the evil. Because at the end of the day, if it's necessary for good, then isn't it kind of good itself in a way? All right. So, well, you wouldn't even want to get rid of it if that's the case. Right. So even trying to see the difference between the two is kind of a, a pointless task because at a deeper level, they're kind of one. Oh, now we're starting to get into uh, uh, an interesting idea here. Note the yin yang symbol. Let, let's examine this idea just a little bit more that, you know, if you've seen a yin yang, it's kind of the symbol of ancient Taoism. Right. And it has like the dark side and the light side. But at the core and the first thing notice is they're balanced. They're equal. They're sort of like one isn't more than the other. They're fundamentally balanced, right? And at the core of darkness is light in the yin yang, right? And at the core of light is darkness. So it's like deep within the deepest evil is actually good. And deep within the deepest good is actually evil. So they're like two forces that just perfectly balance and complete each other and make the whole, si the whole symbol. So evil's not really bad. It's just a part of the whole deeper unity. So if you can just be wise and see that, well, then you know that resisting evil does you can't even do it and even if you could you wouldn't want to because the problem's in your own perception right um and this is an ancient idea in taoism and what is taoism also about it's about non-contention because that's wise non-contention it means don't resist things too much don't try to impose what you want or fight with the world the wisest men just are passive essentially and they don't resist and that's what's really good Hmm. So evil is necessary. You know, it's actually part of good on a deeper level. It's all one and you shouldn't resist it. Hmm. Wow. Who would this belief be really useful to if you could get everyone to believe it? How about the forces of evil? <laughs> and but let's look at how this belief actually recurs in different belief systems. It's in ancient Taoism. And now it's becoming like this thing that we all sort of, hey, you can't have light without darkness. Well, I used to be into Hinduism. Praise the Lord, I'm not. <laughs> Happy I'm not serving Satan uh, like I was before. <laughs> I'm sure I still serve him in some ways inadvertently, but definitely doing a lot better since I read the Bible and believe the gospel. <laughs> so in Hinduism, there's a great quote by a famous Hindu sage that I'll just paraphrase it here. But he was this wise man who everybody looks up to. And he basically said something uh, like, when people asked him, what do we do about the problem of evil? He wisely sat there and he said something to the effect of, uh, there is no true standard by which one thing could be called good and another could be called evil. Because what appears to be good from the perspective of one will be evil from another and vice versa. It is the ego which generates these imaginary categories and suffers from the apparent conflict. But in reality, the reality is formless and without definition, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? that's like the same thing as the Taoism, that, that they're relative, that really evil isn't really even evil. It's almost just like another half of the whole thing that you're not seeing right. And what is it that the real problem is your ego. That's where the real evil exists. What's hilarious is these belief systems say like there is no good and evil, but then they say like, but the, but the, e the ego is evil or you're thinking there's good and evil. That's evil. You know, why don't you just retort? I thought you just said that it wasn't evil. So isn't it good? It's like, no, in that case, there is absolute evil. If you're thinking things are evil, that's what's really evil. <laughs> so anyway, so that, and now that, that's a recent quote by some supposed Hindu master who lived recently said that thing about there is no standard of good and evil. Oh, but let's look at more things. You ever heard Shakespeare? Nothing is good or bad, but thinking make it so. Ah, isn't that interesting? There's a dude back in 1500 something or other saying the same essence as the yin-yang symbol and what this Hindu guy said, who's a leader in Hinduism, uh, and what our current belief is, you can't have light without darkness. It's almost like they're all saying the same belief. But what's weird is, what would Shakespeare have in common with a Hindu guy or an ancient Taoist from China from 2,000 years ago, right? It's weird how they all kind of have this idea. And isn't it a profound idea? You can't have light without darkness, you know? So Shakespeare said that, um, or what if we look at a really modern belief, the sort of the tech beliefs of our current day? Man, you ever heard that reality is really just a simulation? Yeah, consciousness is an illusion, which kind of says that like if something seems really evil, well, I mean, it's not really when you realize it's all an illusion, right? This is just a simulation. So if it's really just simulated good and simulated evil, well, they're not really good and evil, are they? Again, it's all just relative. It's, you know, 
What these are uh, all kind of saying is that let's look at how they operate functionally. So there's the belief, right? You really want to understand the satanic essence of them. Look at how beliefs do things. They're used for something. Like in my last sermon, I talked about the learned helplessness and of how you can get an animal in a cage to believe that it can't escape electric shocks. It doesn't try to, no matter how many times you shock it. So a belief is not just some floaty thing that might or may not be true. A belief has an effect, regardless of whether it's true. That's like irrelevant. If you believe something, it will bring about certain effects, whether it's true or not. So beliefs are very powerful. They're very functional. I think that that's why God makes salvation dependent upon a belief. It's not that he doesn't care about what we do. Oh, no, he cares very much. He cares so much that he knows that a certain fundamental belief will affect what we do so much that he makes our salvation not contingent on trying to do things or doing things, but on whether we accept the belief, because the belief is that consequential. And the belief so powerful that he, he knows that we just believe that in our heart of hearts. He doesn't even need to analyze all of our actions because he knows ultimately the power of that belief. So let's look a little bit more at this belief of you can't have light without darkness. There is no good or evil. They're all relative. It's also deeply nihilistic because it seems to say that there's no progression in time. Like if, if evil is just always there, if the light can't exist without it, it's just like some fundamental thing that never changes. So history has no progress. We couldn't move towards a world with less evil, apparently, because evil has to be there for there to be good and you can't escape it. But really look at how this belief is used. You've got to ask yourself, when would you say this to someone? How is the belief used functionally? Well, It'd be kind of like if somebody was struggling a lot against something that they thought was evil and they couldn't accept it and it was tormenting them a lot and they were thinking of ways to change it and they were pushing at it, but it was pushing back, you know, and you might say, hey, man, you know, I see you're fighting the good fight and that's noble, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, do, do what you can, but you got to know you can't have light without darkness, you know? Well, what effect does that have? Well, it seems to say that, Maybe the real problem isn't the thing that you think is evil. Maybe the problem's within your mind. Because if, if nothing's good or bad, but thinking make it so, and if really it's the ego that sees the false categories of good or bad, uh, blah, 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 then maybe what you should really do instead of wrestling with that thing that's evil is just change a little thing up in here. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you should go from a, of a state of activity in the world to a state of passivity where you just accept things. And what does that all mean? Don't resist the evil. <laughs> Don't fight against it. Well, what happens if you don't? What will happen with the evil? Well, well, then it'll just do whatever it wants. <laughs> so if you were a super evil entity and you wanted a whole society to just be subject to your evil, well, wouldn't this be a great belief? If you could get everyone to believe this, man, you could just do anything you wanted. <laughs> and if someone fought it, you just have everyone remind them, hey, maybe the real problem's in you. Back off with the evil go, baby. You know, cause, well, because after all, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, so... It's really telling people that when they encounter evil in the world, they shouldn't do anything to try to change it or even believe that it's evil. You can't even differentiate it because the yin yang. Think about it. If good and bad are like equal yet opposite forces and one is at the center of the other. And if you can't have one without the other, then really, what's the difference between them? Aren't they just like mirror images that if you looked at it one way, it'd be one. So really, they're like the same. Ooh, all is one. Another uh, profound thing that we hear. Uh, that just seems kind of profound. It, everybody would kind of agree, or at least a lot of people, right? Well, Isaiah 5.20 tells us, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So the Bible tells us that, you know, good and evil are not the same. <laughs> they are not at all the same thing. It even tells us that the light shone and the darkness comprehended it not, and that the darkness could not overcome it. So they're very different things. Um, but isn't it interesting how this ancient belief from Taoism and Hinduism and Shakespeare kind of unites the, the whole different systems. And in our current era, it's just everyone's kind of agreeing on it more and more and more. And it has that totally pacifying uh, effect, if you believe it. Um, so here I want to... Uh, Here I want to explain a little bit about how Satan actually deceives us. Uh, because I guess what I want you to see is that 
really powerful deception is actually a lot easier than you think it would be if you do it in a very clever way. And Satan does not do it in an obvious way. Do you ever wonder, how does he get everyone in society to believe this thing? With the thing about, you got to love yourself first. Dude, it's it's obvious that people that go around loving themselves, that they seem like jerks. But how is it that everyone agrees with the wisdom of that statement? How does he do it? How does he get us to believe these things? I mean, look at what this belief is. You can't have light without dark. It's literally saying that, like, if you see evil, don't resist it. <laughs> you know, don't even try to ditch it. Don't even look at it. Don't try to differentiate it. Just become really passive and let it do whatever it's doing. Now, it seems like if you just said that, nobody's going to agree with that. But how does he get everyone to believe this statement that just, just that's just that dressed up a little bit? And I would say that Satan is like an evil Don Draper. So if you don't know who that is, uh, he was a monk from 14th. So no, I'm just kidding. He was the character from a TV show called Mad Men that's about advertising executives. And basically, he was like this really sexy, clever, manly man from the 60s who like would come up with these brilliant ways to sell people things, you know. And he did it because he's clever, you know, and the, the highlight of the show would be them being like, but the news came out that cigarettes kill everyone. How are we going to keep selling them to people? And he'd be like, you just tell them, tell them it's like this, tell them it's toasted, you know, and then the show, they're like, what do you mean? Well, everyone toasts their tobacco. He's like, no, you don't even mention the health. Don't even say anything. Just tell them, you know, and it's like, and everybody's like, wow, he's done it again. He's a genius. First of all, I have to say that just the fact that we live in an era where advertising is so clearly evil and ruining everyone's lives and making us all buy stuff we don't need. But there's then a TV show with a slick advertising dude who like tricks people into doing this. Shouldn't we all hate the guy on TV? It's like, isn't it funny that like we live in a world where the very thing that's destroying us and yet the show, he's like the protagonist and everybody's like, wow, he's so cool. <laughs> you know, and that's how Satan works. Satan's like, yeah, have him do that, but just make him really sexy. And everybody will think it's cool that he's doing that. You know? So anyway, Satan is like Don Draper in that his way of selling things is just clever. It's clever and it works really well. <laughs> so imagine for a second that you were like, um, you're Satan or you're the evil ruler or whatever. And you're trying to get people to like believe these twisted things that are going to harm them and are the opposite of truth itself. Right. Um, so imagine that you wanted to like convince people of the following thing. You're going to like shout with a megaphone. You want to be like, tell them this, obey me and do not resist my commands. Abandon whatever it is you want for yourself and accept only what I tell you. Believe what I say unquestioningly. You worthless peons who know nothing. Now, imagine you want to get people to agree with that and go along with it. Well, it seems like it'd be hard to do if you said it like that, right? Now, you could try to like phrase it in different ways, but basically you want to say, don't resist me, do everything I say, don't even question me, give up anything you want for yourself and just follow my commands, even if they seem to make you miserable and you're all just a bunch of morons, right? So you want to express that. You want to get them to believe it, right? Well, how do you do it? I mean, it's, it's a lot of people would say, well, people are just never really going to believe that, right? Like no matter how you phrase it, people are probably going to like resist it, right? Cause it's just human nature, isn't it? That we're going to resist and we're going to defy, you know, and we're not going to follow a ruler saying that to us. And what I would say is, dude, a lot of these deceptions, when you look at them, you're like, oh my God, it would actually be so easy to do if you do it like Satan does. Now I don't claim to totally understand how Satan operates, dude. I've just scratched the surface of it. But just go with me here. Like, imagine if you said this, though. <laughs> imagine if you want to say that. But what if you, you know, did it something like this? What if you're the super evil ruler and you, you know, call a meeting and people are around? You sort of say like, hey, everybody, how's it going? Everybody do living their life, doing what you want to do. Yeah, isn't it great? You know, beautiful day outside. Anyway, hey, guys, I was just thinking about something, uh, something that today, you know, we the thing is the most profound human wisdom if you think about it, I think we'd all agree that it's about transcending our egos. Because look, one thing we all know, at the end of the day, the thing that makes us suffer the most is our own ego, you know? And the thing that, that the wise men have achieved throughout the centuries is they were able to overcome their own ego. Uh-oh, my phone's about to die. All right, I'll, I'll redo this part in the next video. All right, so there's my first piece. Thank you guys for listening and uh, much more to come. Love you guys. May the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Speak soon.